Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to um, SGPP's weekly webinar. And today we have with us uh, again, Pagita Wiryawan. It's always a pleasure to have you here with us, sir. And today, Pagita will be talking about SMEs and uh, the global value chain. And before we start, I'd like to ask the attendees and also the Zoom panelists uh, to not click share screen in any circumstances and to reduce network usage and to prevent unnecessary inter interruption, we recommend you to leave your videos and microphones off until you're given the chance to ask questions. And when you want to ask a question during the Q&A segment, please use the uh, Q&A facility or raise your hand. Uh, feature and priorities will be given to SGPP students and SGPP alumni. So, and I'd like to ask all of you to keep your questions concise and quick. And the last one is uh, to, be, to please be considerate to, to other uh, participants. And as for the YouTube live viewers, uh, feel free to submit your questions through the chat section on our YouTube li live stream. And questions that are most relevant to the topic will be. Uh, prioritized. Okay, so Pagita, without further ado, I'd like to invite you to start your lecture. Thank you, uh, Pa Fendri. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, again, it's a pleasure for me to meet with you again uh, at this uh, Zoom uh, meet. Uh, today, I'm going to spend uh, the next uh, few minutes talking about uh, a couple of uh, case studies uh, that would have been brought forth by you know, professors at the Harvard Business School uh, to their students uh, recently. Uh, and, and I wanna put those two case studies in the context of uh, how disruptions have actually taken place in a supply chain uh, and how within each one of uh, the two case studies, uh, companies that were relevant to the disruption that took place within each of the two case studies uh, actually took action uh, and, and how uh, one company's action uh, differed from uh, the action of the other company and how it actually implied uh, and resulted uh, in the, the, the outcomes of uh, the two companies uh, comparatively. Uh, if, if we were to go to the page number four, we have a, slide, a set of slides prepared already. Uh, In, in essence, uh, disruptions uh, within the context of uh, supply chain uh, take place uh, in two ways. Uh, number one, the disruption could take place as a low probability, high impact uh, type of event. Uh, whereas on the other hand, uh, the disruption could take place uh, as a high uh, probability and low impact. And what we might be seeing in the following case study is uh, something that would have been deemed by the audience or the stakeholders as a high probability and low impact event. Uh, but as it turned out, uh, it actually became uh, a high impact and, and low probability uh, event. There was in 2000 or the year 2000, a fire that took place uh, at a semiconductor fabrication plant uh, in Albuquerque. Uh, this was a factory that was owned by Philips, which basically makes you know, microchips for various uh, you know, uh, technology companies and telecommunication companies. And this particular factory uh, was in charge of making 
microchips for the likes of uh, Ericsson and Nokia for their, you know, respective, you know, handphone units. Um, and, and, you know, as the fire uh, took place, uh, the, the person that was in charge of the factory uh, basically thought that it was uh, a typical, you know, manageable type of fire that could be resolved uh, instantaneously or very quickly, and that it would not have any disruptive uh, implications on the supply chain with respect to any of its customers, inclusive of Nokia and Ericsson. Uh, it was not even covered in, in the local newspaper. Uh, it was not, you know, uh, thought of uh, as a big deal by, you know, uh, people in the higher ups in Philips. Uh, so uh, the, the manager of the factory basically made a decision to call upon uh, his, uh, you know, clients, uh, including Ericsson and Nokia. And what, what happened was uh, the reaction between uh, the reaction by Nokia vis-a-vis -vis the reaction by uh, Ericsson uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, colored uh, the, the, the different consequences involving the two different companies. Um, the guy that basically picked up the phone, we go to the next page, uh, from Ericsson, uh, from, you know, as he picked up the phone call from uh, the the guy that was reporting the fire at the factory in uh, Albuquerque in New Mexico uh, thought of it as as a you know a usual you know recurring event that was not supposed to be a big deal uh, and he basically uh, was told by the factory manager that this thing is going to get resolved within a week and things are going to be normalizing again after a week so what what the, the guy at Ericsson uh, took was that you know he, he took it at face value without actually uh, predicting, you know, anything that would, uh, you know, happen otherwise uh, and without actually reporting to, you know, uh, the higher ups within Ericsson, uh, thinking that, you know, things were going to normalize again within a week. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, if, uh, if we take a look at the reaction from Nokia, which took a, a separate phone call from the manager of the factory. We go to the next page on page six. Nokia basically reacted very differently as much as they would have been told that this was a regular uh, high probability and low impact type of event. Uh, they basically anticipated that this, this could you know, get worse uh, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, and they were never in a position to underestimate uh, what was informed to them to the extent that you know the guy that actually took the phone call reported to the higher ups uh, and the higher ups uh, reported to the higher ups uh, to the point where actually the leadership of uh, Nokia uh, made a decision to get on a call with uh, the leadership of Philips to make sure that you know this sort of disruptive event uh, was something that could be fixed uh, within the near foreseeable future and they actually went beyond uh, you know uh, that step of, of discussing, they actually uh, went through the steps of uh, basically trying to figure out a collective effort between Nokia and Philips to try to come up with an alternative uh, supply chain strategy so that they could actually collectively uh, design and produce uh, the chip uh, together while supposedly waiting for only a period of one week until the factory in Albuquerque would uh, actually renormalize. Uh, so, uh, as, as a result, uh, the CEO of uh, Philips, if we go to the next page, and the CEO of Nokia uh, came to a collective decision uh, to basically, you know, try to operate as one company regarding, you know, the components that were basically being disrupted in terms of their production in Albuquerque. So, they figured out an alternative strategy to produce the, the micro uh, chips uh, in other places uh, in, in Europe uh, and also in the US so that this disruption from New Mexico would not be uh, systemic uh, with respect to Nokia's ability to basically produce, uh, distribute and sell their handphones to the rest of the world. Um, if we go to the next page, uh, uh, very, very uh, evidently uh, Ericsson did not have a plan B. Ericsson uh, took uh, the word from Philips uh, at face value without any, uh, without coming up with any sort of an alternative plan. 
uh, and uh, consequently, uh, the factory in Albuquerque was actually closed down for a few more months than the you know previously estimated you know only one week period uh, of downtime. Uh, and as a result of this, uh, Ericsson basically lost about four hundred million dollars worth of revenues within that year. Uh, and uh, more adversely, uh, the, the 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 following year. Uh, Ericsson basically announced its plans to uh, basically terminate its uh, sales of uh, handphones just by way of the fact that they completely uh, underestimated uh, the, the degree to which uh, this uh, disruptive event in Albuquerque uh, would have an impact on the overall supply chain strategy and implementation of uh, Ericsson. Uh, whereas Nokia, uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, this we're talking about the year 2000 here in 2001. Uh, well before the you know the the birth of iPhones and all the other smartphones, uh, Nokia managed to basically stay on uh, you know sustainably uh, for many years thereafter uh, because they took the right steps. They took the right conservative steps uh, as a result of the disruption that was supposed to be uh, only a small impact and high uh, probability event that took place in Albuquerque in New Mexico. Uh, if, if we were to go to the next page, uh, I think the observation uh, with respect to, you know, the two companies' reactions uh, with respect to what happened uh, at the Phillips uh, factory in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, is that, you know, typically in an organization uh, that, that has somebody who worries more than the others, uh, it is usually uh, the cause for bad news to travel faster. Uh, in that particular organization as compared to another organization where we do not have, uh, you know, the kind of personality who is supposed to be the chief worry officer who is supposed to basically disseminate the bad news to everybody around the organization so that, you know, at every level of the game, be it at the bottom, the middle, and the top levels of the organization, uh, people could actually... Uh, collectively come up with uh, an analysis of the situation and hopefully with a proposed framework for resolving uh, the disruptive situation that has occurred. And I think the, the, the big distinction that we could make here between what Ericsson did vis-a-vis -vis what Nokia did uh, would have been that, you know, Nokia uh, had that mentality, had that culture of having a chief worry officer that basically allowed for the bad news to travel uh, as quickly as possible to everybody around and everybody vertically downward and uh, and and upward, so that you know uh, the the leadership of that organization would uh, take the necessary steps to uh, jump in uh, in a call with the CEO Phillips and jump in in a discussion and jump in with the necessary steps to basically uh, come up with an alternative uh, producing you know capability so that there wouldn't be any. Uh, structural disruptions with respect to their supply chain. Whereas Ericsson, on the other hand, did not have the kind of, you know, mentality or culture of uh, a worry or a chief worry officer. And they just basically took things for granted. They took it at face value. They didn't think it was something to be worried about. And uh, nobody else but the guy that basically took uh, the phone call from Philips uh, uh, knew about well, how this thing would impact uh, the overall uh, dynamics of the supply chain of Ericsson and of course uh, they paid a much more dear price uh, you know in the year after when they decided to close down the the telephone or the cellular uh, you know a communication business uh, I want to go to the next uh, case study uh, and this happened some years ago in 2011 in uh, Japan in Fukushima where we had, uh, you know, a tidal wave that would have been by way of the tsunami, uh, uh, which would have been by way of, you know, one of the largest earthquakes that ever took place in Asia or in the world uh, that basically, you know, caused 40 meters of waves uh, traveling, you know, all the way to 10 kilometers inland uh, and with a level seven meltdown at three nuclear reactors in Fukushima Daiichi which basically affected uh, so many uh, situations around the region and also around the world. Uh, the, the, the consequences of this uh, would have been felt by a number of the automotive companies, namely Nissan, Honda, and Toyota. If uh, we go to the next page, 
Nissan uh, basically had, you know, a couple of, of, you know, one factory within the region and a foundry uh, in, in the region uh, similar to Nissan. Uh, Toyota also had damage uh, facilities at the Iwate factory, uh, which would have been a subsidiary Kanto Auto Works. And they also had uh, a Miyagi factory within the prefecture of uh, Fukushima. Uh, mm. And Honda similarly also had, you know, its uh, automotive or production capability affected by the tsunami that took place. Uh, whereas Mazda, uh, there was not a whole lot of significant impact on any of their uh, production capabilities in Fukushima. But what, what, uh, what was different was basically in uh, the steps that each one of the three companies, i.e. Honda, Toyota, and Nissan, took. Uh, Nissan, similar to you know, how Nokia reacted to the fire that took place at the factory in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico, uh, took things uh, at hand uh, in, in, in a way that you know, they, they basically try to figure out how to uh, uh, you know, re- jig and reformat uh, the, the, the supply of uh, the, the parts that were supposed to be coming from Fukushima for their production capabilities elsewhere. And they basically made a decision on foregoing the installation of the GPS capability in some of the cars that they deem were not uh, high margin uh, selling or high margin marketing. Uh, while they they put priorities on installing the GPS capabilities that were being produced in Fukushima for uh, some of the cars that were actually off high margin uh, capabilities, as a result of which they were able to reformat the production uh, you know algorithm uh, for both the high margin and the low margin uh, to the extent that they could uh, still carry on with the sales of uh, the low margin cars, except that these low margin cars. Uh, were being sold without the GPS capabilities that had to be produced by the, the factories that were being disrupted in Fukushima. Uh, as a result of which, if we go to the next page, uh, Nissan was able to basically show uh, the kind of uh, performance that you know, the other two car making companies were not uh, able to show. Uh, you know, uh, the tsunami took place in March of 2000. Uh, 11. Uh, as you can see from the graphs, the three companies were severely impacted. Uh, they all went uh, into negative territory, but Nissan was able to recover uh, in a very quick fashion because of uh, their taking ownership of the disruption in a very uh, you know, instantaneous manner and because of their ability to collectively uh, decide on how to rejig the algorithm uh, for the, the supply chain capabilities as opposed to or as compared to how Honda and Toyota uh, reacted uh, with respect to the disruptive event in Fukushima uh, as, as a result of which uh, their production capability was uh, still well below forecast uh, even all the way until the month of August in 2011 where uh, you know Nissan was able to actually be above uh, forecast uh, in its production uh, starting as early as the latter part of April. And, and this, I think, is, is uh, uh, exemplary. Uh, and this is basically a, a reflection of how Nissan uh, was able to not only outperform Honda and Toyota in responding to the disruptive event in Fukushima, but it, al it also reflected upon how Nissan was able to have that sort of a culture and mentality of a chief worry officer within the organization so that he or she could actually, you know, uh, gather uh, everybody from all over the world uh, within the Nissan or broad Nissan organization to actually come up with a decision uh, on how to actually best move forward. And one of the key steps that they took basically was to forego the installation of the GPS capabilities into the low margin uh, you know, selling uh, or car selling, uh, you know, uh, levels uh, as opposed to, you know, the high margin where they stuck to the strategy of installing the GPS. Uh, so in, in a nutshell, their, their production uh, was disrupted, but they were able to actually optimize upon the already disrupted uh, production uh, because of the Fukushima, um, you know, uh, tsunami. Uh, 
the next page would basically illustrate how Nissan was able to outperform, uh, you know, the rest of the automotive uh, making uh, automotive uh, makers in in Japan. Uh, Nissan production in Japan declined only by 3.8 percent in the six months ended in August of 2011 compared to the 2011 forecast. And for all of 2011, uh, Nissan production was actually up by 9.3 percent because they were able to actually get you know, above the, the curve as early as May or a latter part of April, while all the other automakers uh, were down uh, for 9.3% uh, in their production, uh, you know, capability for the whole of uh, 2011. So in essence, Nissan has shown the fastest recovery among the Japanese automakers and was the, was the last, uh, the least affected or affected by the earthquake. And in May 2011, Nissan's domestic vehicle production was about the same as it was in May 2010. So this is quite uh, significant, uh, you know, in the context of how the Fukushima uh, earthquake and tsunami uh, should have or would have or could have uh, adversely or significantly adversely affected the production capability of Nissan. But Nissan for you know, the whole duration of 2011 was able to actually maintain production levels equivalent to, you know, those of uh, the year before, i.e. 2010. If uh, we go to the next uh, page, if we go to page 15, immediately after the disaster, I think what's notable was that Nissan's global disaster control headquarters, uh, which uh, were headed up by the chief operating officer, uh, equivalently, you know, the chief worry officer uh, was convened uh, as to evaluate the impact on operations and to oversee the restoration activities. Uh, and a recovery committee was established very quickly as to coordinate the global recovery actions involving people from all over the world within the Nissan, uh, you know, establishment. In particular, you know, to to work on re-optimizing the entire supply chain. Uh, that would have been uh, affected uh, by the tsunami in Fukushima. So basically, they, they launched the Global Disaster Control Headquarters just 15 minutes after the earthquake uh, had uh, occurred, uh, as opposed to Honda and Toyota, which took a lot longer in responding to the tsunami that took place. And, and the team within Nissan immediately gathered and stress, uh, assess uh, damage while overseeing restoration efforts at various uh, you know, facilities. Uh, I think what could be noted from this is that uh, not only did they respond very quickly, but they were able to actually assess and reassess as frequently, uh, uh, you know, as possible. Uh, I think within, within you know, uh, a, as with every disruptive uh, situation, uh, we, can, we can assume that, you know, there is no one size fits all for all kinds of uh, situations that would have been affected by the disruption. Uh, it is important for, you know, be it small, medium, or large organizations to actually uh, try to be able to assess and reassess at every step of the game so that they could actually mold and remold uh, the, the, the strategy of coming up with, a, with an alternative uh, means of optimizing the supply chain. Next. Why did Nokia and Nissan do that, you know, our company should have done? Uh, what has worked especially well for your business? Uh, during the next page. I think I've, uh, uh, if we go to the previous page, if, you know, the question that needs to be asked to all of us is that what is it that can be learned from the lessons that, you know, basically every company went through whenever, you know, they went through a disruption? And what is it that can be learned uh, from what the Nokias of the world did, uh, you know, during that disruption in Albuquerque in 2000? What is it that actually Nissan uh, do, you know, during that disruption in 2011? Uh, that was so different. And, and I think it, it is safe to assume that, you know, it's not a rocket science uh, in terms of what they did. But uh, I think what makes it seemingly like a rocket science is that 
you know, they, they, they have basically infused some sort of a discipline within the organization and also more importantly within the culture uh, that, you know, they basically showed, uh, you know, the, the kinds of uh, concern, uh, worry, uh, and alertness uh, that, you know, most organizations, if not many organizations, uh, you know, tend to either not know how to react or most organizations tend to take at face value or most organizations tend to underestimate uh, and, and I think, you know, if you put this in the context of what and how COVID-19 has enveloped uh, many, you know, elements of the global supply chain, uh, I think it's safe to assume that there's a lot of companies uh, in Indonesia and beyond uh, that actually, number one, do not know how to respond to the disruption within the global supply chain. Uh, number two, they, they probably, you know, take it at face value that, you know, things are probably going to you know, renormalize and be okay again in a month or two. Uh, and, and number three, uh, they're, they're probably, you know, scurrying around uh, with, within their organizations, but uh, still not being able to, you know, find solutions on, on how things have been so disruptive to their day-to-day -day supply chain. And, and, and I think it's important to assume and learn uh, and, and hopefully uh, implement within, you know, each organization uh, that, you know, we have somebody who can actually, number one, be more worried than everybody else. And we can have somebody that can actually uh, alert everybody else at every level of the game. And we can have somebody who can actually, uh, you know, uh, make sure that there's some sort of a formation uh, within the organization that could, number one, study and analyze, and number two, uh, come up with uh, some sort of uh, set of steps that needs to be taken. But more importantly, I think they need to have the ability to be flexible in their approach because of, of, of the fact that every disruption is actually very different from the others. Uh, and and, and in that, that you may take one or two steps that may be incorrect, so that the open-mindedness uh, in, in being able to rejig your earlier analysis and rejig your earlier, uh, you know, concocted uh, set of steps uh, uh, based on the analysis, uh, you know, would be, uh, you know, uh, open-minded. And, and that, I think, is important in resolving and solving, uh, you know, a particular concerning situation because of a disruptive event uh, anywhere around the world. Next. Now, if we go to page 20, I think uh, what we could also learn from the lessons of Nissan and Nokia uh, would be that uh, to the extent that, you know, we're all affected by, you know, any supply or any kind of supply chain disruptions, uh, you know, how we deal with it actually affects our reputational capital how we deal with it actually affects how we're going to be able to be trusted by our stakeholders and by our clientele. Uh, and, and I can assure you that, you know, in the succeeding years after 2001 and 2011 for, you know, both Nokia and Nissan respectively, uh, they stood out very differently as compared to the other competitors. And they stood out to be trusted, uh, you know, to a much greater degree uh, than uh, the other guys uh, that basically did not show the kind of number one alertness and kind of open mindedness in dealing with the crisis, uh, and and I think it's important for for all of us that are basically involved in be it the the micro or the small or the medium entrepreneurships to to basically have that sort of a mindset uh, in in the context of either a COVID nineteen or any other kind of disruptive event that could take place uh, in in the future. If we go to page uh, 21, I want to put basically uh, the earlier section of this lecture. I've, I've basically talked about two case studies that took place in, in, in the context of a microchip uh, processing or a microchip production capability, and, and also in the context of how a factory uh, you know, within the automotive uh, domain has affected the performances of different automotive companies. Uh, so I, I want to basically just put this in a broader context of, of how a leader of an organization, be it small, micro, medium, or large, uh, should take into account, uh, you know, how the COVID-19 has 
or might have affected you know their businesses uh, they they number one I think have to take into account uh, the the issue as being a medical issue uh, and, and number two they have to take into account how this medical issue or health issue has uh, basically affected uh, the finances of the game and 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 how the medical or health issue and the financial issues have also affected uh, the company's ability to you know basically you know have a proper supply chain capability and 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 you put that later on in the context of how all these issues might affect or might have affected the the overall economic uh, equation uh, i've said in in past lectures about how the covid-19 has basically you know, started out as a medical or health issue and how this thing has impacted both the capital markets and also the economy of, of the world, uh, the region, and also of Indonesia. Uh, but, but consequently, all these issues of medical elements or financial elements or supply chain elements and economic elements uh, have, I think, a not so small effect on the psychology of, uh, you know, every stakeholder in the game. And, and I think... Uh, you know, you all uh, have realized uh, the fact that, you know, we're all staying at home for the last two to three weeks has affected the psychology of the game. Uh, you know, be it, you know, yourself that's been staying at home or your stakeholders or your customers uh, that, that may not be able to physically engage in any economic activity with you. Uh, I, I think the psychological element of the game uh, is something that cannot be underestimated also. We go to the next page. Uh, page 23. What characteristics of the event uh, itself uh, make it different? Uh, and, and I think what differentiates uh, the Nokias of the world and the uh, you know, Nissans of the world is, is not only the, the presence of the chief worry officer, but it's also the the ownership taking and the leadership of the leader and and within each one of those two organizations uh, you know we had basically the type of leadership that basically put priorities on having somebody that could serve as the chief worry officer that could alert everybody be it a small type of event that could be deemed as a high likelihood event uh, which could turn out to be a low likelihood event, but a high impact event. Uh, and, and I think uh, leadership within an organization uh, is, is important uh, in uh, not only defining how we actually reassess uh, you know, the process with which we wanna resolve a situation, but leadership is, is a key ingredient uh, in any organization and making sure that the transition from a disruption uh, to a resolution is is brought about in the most uh, you know systematic, most efficient, and most effective manner. Uh, and and we 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 know uh, that you know there are leaderships in many organizations that are you know capable of taking on an unprecedented situation uh, in in ways that actually have brought about transition in a very smooth manner from a disruption to a resolution and also sustenance beyond a resolution. Uh, next, page 24, uh, there is no pre-cooked uh, answer to any unprecedented event, be it a tsunami, be it a fire in a factory, be it a COVID-19. Uh, who would have thought five months ago that COVID-19 was going to be, you know, this significant? Who would have thought that even COVID-19 was going to take place, you know, shortly thereafter? Uh, as as a result of this being so unprecedented, uh, you know it's it's it, it's important to you know resist uh, the pressure to provide quick answers, and most of them will turn out to be wrong. And it's uh, I think it it dovetails into the importance of of having a leader that could actually assess and reassess the situation on a continuous basis so that he could actually collect and involve as many people as possible within the organization uh, so that they do not come up with a pre-cooked answer. Uh, you know, this cannot be a one-size-fits-all type of strategy. And you, you've got to remind yourself and others that we don't yet fully understand the situation, you know, as the situation is evolving. Like I can tell you in the context of the COVID-19, 
uh, what what I knew, uh, you know, two months ago is not necessarily less than what I know right now. Uh, you know, with all the information that I've sucked up from any kind of media, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm more knowledgeable about, you know, how to deal with COVID-19 today than I would have been two months ago. Uh, I may be more informed, that, but it doesn't mean I, I'm actually better informed in, in terms of, you know, having to deal with the COVID-19. So in that sense, uh, the situation, you know, continues to change and it necessitates uh, you know, the need uh, for, you know, the leadership and his or her team to basically assess and reassess and come up with uh, new analytical tools uh, and execution steps that would be necessary in, in basically combating uh, the crisis or the disruption. And it's also important uh, for that process to have a very quick uh, feedback loop in terms of what you feel as a pulse on the ground vis-a-vis uh, -vis what you have to actually reassess and redo at, at, uh, you know, at the office so that you, know, you have a much better you know, execution, not only plan, but steps on the ground. Next page. What are the key elements of the approach that we're going to need in dealing with uh, you know, a disruptive event? Uh, number one, uh, you know, structure, which I've you know, outlined earlier. We need to have uh, the ability of uh, having somebody who could serve as a worry officer, who could alert, uh, who could inform, who could get as many people as possible to take ownership uh, with the situation. And number two, we got to make sure that we have the right people in the right spots. Not only the right person as a chief worry officer, but the right people who can actually you know, give the right kind of feedback, be it from a marketing standpoint, from a sales standpoint, from a production standpoint, from a distribution standpoint, and from any point of view that would be necessary for the leadership to actually come up with a holistic approach uh, for resolving the situation. And of course, the uh, number three, it's uh, the problem solving attitude uh, and also uh, methodology. Uh, that's needed for the organization uh, to actually come up with uh, the necessary uh, steps to combat uh, the disruption. Next. I've talked about this, you know, the need to oversee all aspects of the event, not just in the context of this being a medical or health issue, but in the context of this being a financial issue, a logistical issue, an economic issue, and also a psychological issue. Uh, we need to understand, uh, you know, and identify, and, on, you know, and identify the evolving and emerging issues and competing priorities. And we've got to be able to have that sort of a feedback loop from, you know, what's happening on the ground so that we can analyze and reanalyze and we can reassess and we can also reframe the issues as questions and decisions. And at the end of the day, you know, we can formulate and delegate problem solving for specific issues to uh, other groups. If we go to page 28, this basically summarizes the uh, systematic approach, uh, you know, from how you actually set the priorities and the goals as a result of a problem occurring, uh, how you actually uh, try to better understand the situation, uh, you know, be it the tsunami, be it the, the fire at the factory, be it COVID-19, and how you actually develop optionalities. And, you know, the optionalities could be, uh, you know, multi. Uh, you know, it, it, cannot, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't have to be just one option that you can come up. It could be two or three or four options that you can come up with and you can test out, you know, the degree to which of, uh, you know, each one of these optionalities has, you know, effectiveness or efficiency on the ground. And, and you, you try to predict the outcomes of each one of these uh, options that you try to come up with uh, in responding to the crisis or the disruption. Uh, and uh, last, uh, you basically choose the best course of action. And what you need to do is you got to make sure that, you know, item number four, uh, i.e. The, the course of action that you have chosen, you know, is put back in a context of how you can reprioritize how you can reset the goal how you can reset the objective and how you can actually have a much better much more refined understanding of of the situation so that you can actually come up 
with uh, a better analysis of how you can resolve uh, the disruption or the, 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 the event that has been adversely affecting uh, your business. So in sum, I've, I've basically talked about you know, two case studies uh, that have, uh, you know, in a good way affected some companies, but in a so bad way, you know, affected uh, many other companies. Uh, and number two, I've talked about, uh, you know, the need to actually have the right kind of culture, the right kind of process, the right kind of leadership. Uh, and, and number three, uh, I've, I've talked about the need to basically be able to have a feedback loop between what you have set out as a course of action uh, and uh, the ability to analyze and reanalyze, uh, you know, so that you can actually remold the action steps uh, for a better, you know, uh, refinement uh, of the approach and also a better solution of uh, the problem. So uh, as, as a result of all this, I want to put uh, all these in the context of how I'm seeing, uh, you know, supply chain possibly changing going forward. Uh, to put this in a macro setting, uh, you know, we've got a global GDP of about $85 trillion. And we've got a total trade or global trade a figure of around $40 trillion, uh, less than 50% of the global GDP of the world. Uh, Trade basically is to some extent a reflection of, uh, you know, how supply chain has been globalized or globally distributed. Uh, the world has changed in a big way. You know, 20 to 30 years ago, uh, you would have had, you know, the whole of the aircraft being made in one country or maybe one province or one city. Uh, whereas now, uh, in order for anybody or any you know aircraft manufacturing company to manufacture an aircraft, uh, that particular company has basically the you know so many countries, so many cities, so many provinces being involved in producing every part of the aircraft. You know, you can have the nuts and bolts being produced in Toulouse in France. You could have you know the engine being produced in China. You could have the tires being made in Indonesia. You could have the wings being made in the United States. Uh, so uh, the fact that you know the global supply chain has been more sparsely you know uh, distributed or more globally distributed, uh, that has affected uh, the, the degree uh, to which global trade has ascended, uh, you know, since 20 to 30 years ago. Uh, and, and um, you know, now we, we have a global trade figure of around 40 trillions. Uh, but we also, uh, at the same time, uh, have been seeing what I've been saying earlier, you know, the increased uh, bilateralization of conversations, which, which only implies that, you know, we're probably not likely to see that 40 trillion figure uh, going up uh, much further at the rate that people have become much more polarized right now than, you know, 10 to 20 years today at the rate that people are less likely to multilateralize uh, so that they could better or more bilateralize with each other. Uh, that has, uh, that will have implications on the degree to which, you know, the global trade of 40 trillion uh, dollars, uh, you know, to the, the, the ability of the 40 trillion uh, dollar figure to, you know, to go up uh, any, any farther. So we are seeing a potentially finite limitation of how, number one, trade will go up. And we're seeing a finite limitation as to how the global supply chain is going to get further globalized. Uh, as a result of which, uh, I think it really boils down to, you know, how each country is, is basically trying to reshape its uh, productivity. Uh, and I've been saying this many times over, uh, you know, in terms of the need for Indonesia to actually ramp up uh, its uh, marginal productivity on a PPP adjusted basis. If, if Indonesia were to, uh, you know, be a much more efficient country, much more effective country from a supply chain standpoint, uh, I think it needs to be ready uh, for, you know, a much more bilateralized uh, conversation with anybody that's got, you know, a higher marginal productivity than we do. Uh, as a result of which, you know, I think it, it, it is upon us that we've got to actually ramp up our own marginal productivity so that we do not have to rely too much on, uh, you know, the outside, uh, you know, or externalities uh, so that we're not likely to suffer 
uh, from you know, any disruptive uh, nature of events uh, that we might have been seeing in the last couple of months. Um, you know, I think it's safe to assume uh, that you know, by way of uh, the disruption that has taken place in the supply chain, mostly in China, and the disruption in the supply chain in Indonesia by way of the fiscal distancing policies, uh, at many levels of the government, uh, uh, you know, it's time or high time, you know, for Indonesia to think about, uh, you know, how we can actually, uh, you know, rely less on externalities as opposed to, you know, internalities. Uh, uh, and, and, and I think, uh, you know, to the extent that, you know, we want to get our own handphones, we want to get our own electronics as opposed to relying on you know uh, overseas uh, for our day-to-day -day consum uh, consumption of, of, of goods and services, uh, we've got to basically be able to ramp up our production capabilities. And and our our only you know uh, our you know ramping up uh, you know our production capabilities will you know significantly hinge on our ability to actually be much more marginal and productive. Because if we're not, uh, then you know, we're just not gonna be competitive and we're, we're, we're gonna continue you know, depending on you know, uh, products that are being made uh, you know, overseas. And that I think will have a large uh, bearing on, on how supply chain will you know, come into play in Indonesia. So, uh, in, in, in a nutshell, uh, Indonesia's trade to GDP ratio is at about 40%, which means that Indonesia relies on trade uh, quite heavily uh, for the purposes of our own day-to-day -day consumption, whereas the, the, the ratio of the total trade to GDP for China is about 30%. Ours is about 40%. And the ratio of total trade to GDP for the United States is about 20%. Uh, so right there, it kind of tells you uh, not only how open-minded uh, and open-ended they are with respect to the rest of the world, but it also tells you, you know, the, the extent to which that they can actually depend on themselves for the production of goods and services that they're going to be needing to consume on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so, uh, let me pause right there and take any questions on, on, you know, uh, how, you know, global supply chain has been affected, uh, you know, by way of some of the disruptive events that we've seen in the last 20 years. Thank you, Pagita, um, for the very interesting lecture. I was actually in Japan in 2011 when the tsunami happened and I was, amazed how quickly they got back on their feet um, after that uh, catastrophe. So we have one question back from uh, Anto. Two questions actually, uh, one from Anto. Mas Anto, go ahead. He is uh, a student from our previous batch, batch five, pa, who just, um, yeah, pre previous to this batch. Go ahead, Mas Anto. Wait a minute. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Pak Gita. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, yes, uh, you've been explained uh, very brief about the uh, condition faced by Nokia and uh, Nissan previously. Uh, what I'm trying to uh, understood more is about uh, the consequences of the crisis faced by Indonesia right now. Is there how should the government uh, react to anticipate the further crisis that will be happen to Indonesia as the consequences also from the COVID-19? That's my question, Pagita. Thanks. Uh, well, I, I think it's safe to assume that uh, the COVID-19, as much as it sounds uh, like an unprecedented event, uh, but it is still considered as a white swan. It's not a black swan. Uh, the difference between a black swan and a white swan is that a black swan is completely unprecedented. You never thought about it, you, you know, within your wildest imagination that things like this were gonna occur. Uh, whereas this, I would still consider as a white swan. Uh, white swan is some sort of an anomaly that you could actually anticipate. Uh, and, and we could have anticipated this by way of what we've gone through in the past. Uh, i.e. the SARS. SARS took place in 2002, November, 
and it you know took place until uh, August of 2003. Uh, and and the COVID-19 is actually a mutation of the SARS virus. Uh, so in, in, in that sense, uh, this is something that we could actually have anticipated if we had been, you know, really concerned about SARS back then. And we had been actually using the lessons from SARS uh, for purposes of anticipating for any future, you know, low likelihood, high impact event, uh, which is like the COVID-19 that's enveloping all of us right now. So... Uh, if, if the question is, you know, what do we need to do to anticipate, you know, any potential anomaly again in the future, uh, if, it, if it relates to, you know, a viral type of anomaly, uh, anomaly or disruption, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've got to basically, you know, learn to copycat, you know, you know, maybe some of the things that the Taiwanese and the Koreans and the Japanese are doing. We've got to basically discipline ourselves in, you know, wearing a mask every day you know, even if there is no viral infections. And, and I think if, if we were to, you know, discipline ourselves in doing that from now on in anticipation of a future viral infection that could be a mutation of the COVID-19, uh, I think we would stand much more ready uh, right. than we would be right now or than ever. Now, if, if the potential disruption or anomaly uh, would relate to a non-viral type of infection, uh, I think it's a more fundamental uh, question uh, in terms of how Indonesia could actually Indonesia stand ready. Stand. Uh, we, uh, we, 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 have, we, we have basically seen, uh, you know, how, you know, some, uh, you know, communication, you know, within the government and some communication uh, between government agencies, uh, be it, you know, at the national vis-a-vis -vis the regional levels, uh, could have been uh, better coordinated, right? So I, I think if you ask me, how do we actually anticipate any future kind of disruption that would be equivalent to a COVID-19 or even worse than a COVID-19, I think we've got to make sure that the coordination amongst government agencies within the center and also between the center and the regional uh, levels, uh, you know, would be better. Uh, and, and to the extent that we can actually improve upon the coordination of the government agencies and their communication capabilities, uh, I, I think we would be uh, better prepared. So that's the second uh, answer to your question. And, and the third question, I mean, the third answer to your question would be, you know, we need to be economically and financially ready. And we have come to recognition that we are not financially ready as to combat uh, the magnitude of, uh, you know, the, the, the effect of COVID-19 on our economy. Uh, you know, we've had a couple of discussions earlier about our fiscal limitations to the extent that we may have to explore other alternatives of financing, you know, the fiscal space. Uh, you can call it, you know, printing money or you can call it borrowing or you can call it whatever. But, but to the extent that we can build up our resources, our reserves, our fiscal space, our monetary space, uh, to a much greater extent than we have as of today, that I think would translate to our more or greater preparedness, you know, vis-a-vis -vis or with respect to any potential, you know, disruptive or catastrophic event that we're going to be experiencing in the future. That's kind of a long-winded answer to your question about how do we get ready for the next crisis. Okay, Mas Anto, did, did that answer your question? Yes, thanks a lot, Pagita. Thank you. So we have uh, one questioner from our attendee, Pagita Ananda Setio Ivananto. Uh, go ahead. Um, you can unmute yourself and, and talk with Pagita. Uh, hello, Pagita. Uh, nice to... Uh, it, was, it was really an inspiring lecture, and it's my second lecture from you. Last time I followed your lecture uh, with the RECAT organization, and uh, it's nice to see that you presented in a different angle today. Uh, so, and, and nice to meet you again after nine years, last time I met you when you were still chairman of KPM. So my question uh, is, uh, I'm running a joint venture uh, Japan and, in between Japan and Indonesia, and I'm closely following the uh, phenomenon where uh, more and more Japanese companies, and actually this already decided politically by the Japanese uh, government to relocate some of the industries from uh, China, especially to uh, especially to the Southeast Asian market, 
I'm just wondering, are we well aware of this opportunity? Uh, and is it, uh, uh, I mean, like, can we actually capture uh, this opportunity that we can relocate these industries to Indonesia? Uh, and if not, then what are what do we need to prepare so that we can capture this opportunity? Because this really related to the, uh, the to the venture company that that I'm running right now. Uh, thank you very much, Pagita. I hope you can enlighten uh, us on this matter. Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, we can. I think we have a golden opportunity to capture uh, and recapture to some extent. You know, we have lost uh, some opportunities to our neighboring countries because they were a lot more proactive in enticing, you know, Japanese uh, investments and other countries' investments into their respective countries. Uh, uh, look, the Japanese government uh, has, has made a conscious decision to basically relocate. I'm, I'm well aware of that. They're also providing incentives to, you know, Japanese companies for relocating out from China to, you know, other uh, Asian countries, and, and I think most notably Southeast Asian countries. But, but you've got to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, Indonesia, I think has pluses and minuses, okay? The, the pluses are quite obvious. Uh, Indonesia has got scale, you know, it's the biggest population of Southeast Asia. It makes up about 43% of the total Southeast Asian population. And it makes up also, you know, almost the same, you know, in terms of, you know, the GDP, it makes up about 43% of Southeast Asia's, you know, collective GDP. So uh, within logic, you know, Indonesia should be the first beneficiary of any relocation of, uh, you know, manufacturing capabilities by the Japanese companies. But uh, unfortunately, on the downside or on the minus side, I think the Vietnamese have uh, played the game a little bit more cleverly than, than we have in recent times uh, by way of doing certain things. Number one, they've basically been very proactive in offering, you know, tax uh, incentives for anybody from around the world to, to put up companies in Vietnam. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're getting tax holidays for 20 years, not having to pay taxes, you know, uh, at the corporate level. Um, and uh, they, they're, they're being offered, you know, free land banks, you know, for themselves to basically put up manufacturing capabilities. And, and they're, they're dealing with, you know, not so confusing uh, type of uh, messages, you know, from the government of Vietnam. Uh, whereas in Indonesia, I think we're still going through a bit of each one of these three items, uh, you know, uh, issues where we're not able yet to, uh, you know, provide uh, full-blown and proactive tax incentives to anybody that wants to build a factory here or build anything here. Uh, and we're not able to provide, you know, free uh, land, uh, you know, for them to build anything on it. And we're not able to basically show a coherent, uh, if not you know, a, a, a less confusing type of communication than whatever some of these investors are experiencing, you know, when they go and visit Vietnam. So I would, I would actually be cautious of Vietnam as, as a competitor who's been taking our lunch for, for quite some time in the last few years. Uh, I was mindful of that when I was at the BKPM, but, but I, I, I basically pitch to anybody, including those in Japan, uh, with a higher pitch on, you know, the scale, uh, i.e. Indonesia at the end of the day has much bigger scale, uh, not only in terms of our labor uh, a pool, but also in terms of our consumptive propensity with 270 million people, uh, we can consume much more, much faster than any other country. You know, Vietnam with only 100 million, you know, Thailand, you know, with less than 100 million, the Philippines less than 100 million. We, we, we stand, I think, a lot farther, a lot higher, uh, and a lot bigger than any other country. So this, these are, I think, some of the attributes that we've got to proactively market to anybody, not just Japan. But, but I do see an opportunity that could arise out of Japan instantaneously. But I also see opportunities that could also arise from many other companies uh, from the United States and, and Europe. Uh, and also South Korea that would want to relocate their, their manufacturing capabilities out of China. And, and this is not, uh, you know, an anti-China type of gesture, but this is, I think, as I said earlier, this is sort of like a gesture to basically diversify the global supply chain uh, footprint so that, you know, we're not uh, too dependent on, on one country, you know, uh, you know, in producing you know, 80 to 90% of the goods and services that the world over needs to consume. Uh, thank you very much, Pagita. If I may, just a bit of uh, giving my comment sure. answer. 
uh, thank you for highlighting Vietnam because I'm also I also traveled to Vietnam quite uh, uh, two times recently, and I I understood the way they try to give clarity to the investor and trying to bring them to uh, uh, provide them a big push for them to invest more to Vietnam. And uh, and uh, and the issue uh, regarding to the issue that I, I I asked to you just now, I also communicate closely with the Indonesian embassy in Tokyo, and and I actually I'm in fact now in Japan uh, and going back after the COVID is over, and I'm quite surprised to know that uh, uh, the export from the Indonesian uh, from the Japanese companies in Indonesia actually uh, uh, especially going to the Vietnamese market. Uh, the Japanese principals are taking more cars from the Thai uh, factory compared to the Indonesian factory. So uh, I, I understand that we need to bring them back to, uh, we need to relocate, if possible, the, the industry from China to Indonesia. But uh, we also need to understand how actually we are competitive uh, in terms of uh, our export uh, product uh, when it comes to uh, emerging markets like to Vietnam. Uh, so. Do you have any comment about this uh, issue about we are actually losing competitive with the same brand uh, between one country to another? Uh, maybe this well, can look, be our evaluation. It, 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 it boils down to the earlier comment I've made uh, in that, you know, we need to ramp up our marginal productivity, right? Uh, to the extent that we can ramp up our marginal productivity, uh, you know, to the levels that we're seeing in Singapore, we're seeing in Thailand, we're seeing in Vietnam, uh, then I think, uh, you know, it's automatic that people will look at us more proactively. Uh, and, and to the extent that we can be more productive, uh, I think it's going to translate to the higher degree of our exportation anywhere, uh, not just in the context of our exporting goods and services to Thailand and Vietnam and the rest. But, you know, it, it, it boils down to our ability to improve our marginal productivity. To the extent we cannot, uh, then we're just going to lose out to other places that have been able to show not only higher mar marginal productivity, but they've been able to show greater ease of doing business. And, and Indonesia has been improving on the ease of doing business on the World Bank scale. Uh, you know, we're, we're now, you know, uh, below 100. You know, during my time, it was still at 110, 115. Uh, so we've gotten much better in the last five years in terms of our competitiveness, but it hasn't been accompanied by our ability to basically increase our marginal productivity. So that is, I think, one of the impeding factors of, uh, you know, with respect to our exportation of goods and services. But, you know, if, if, if you take a long view on all this, I'm not worried because at the end of the day, what's going to tip the scale is actually the scale. And Indonesia has a far greater scale. Look, I mean, if, if, if any Japanese you know, automotive company out there were to try to make a decision on whether they want to ramp up you know, production capability in Indonesia or Vietnam, it's very simple. They're just going to take a view on you know, how many kilometers of roads and highways are being built by the Indonesians vis-a-vis -vis those being built by Vietnam and how many people are going to be in Indonesia vis-a-vis -vis, you know, uh, those in uh, Vietnam and, you know, how productive, uh, you know, would the Indonesians be vis-a-vis -vis those in Vietnam and how easy it is, uh, you know, for, for a Japanese company to, to build a factory in Indonesia vis-a-vis -vis building a factory in Vietnam. So those, those four attributes will come into the equation and they'll, they'll make a decision. I would bet in the long run, I think Indonesia is going to win out. Okay, thank you very much, Pagit. I hope we do have some drastic measures to improve our marginal productivity uh, with your guidance, uh, I believe. I hope so. Yeah, thank you, Pagit. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, it is possible for me to give uh, some insight, Pagita. Okay, sure. Related to, yes, I've been working at Vietnam Indonesian uh, Consulate General for six years. I'm also teaching at Vietnam National University. So when we are trying to compare Indonesia and Vietnam, there will be uh, very significant differences. Uh, first of all, there will be a political stability, firm and solid stability in Vietnam that we cannot deny and compare to Indonesia because Vietnam is a communist country. And second of all, of course, the ease of business like what you've been explained before is very clear in Vietnam. Uh, and the third of all, of course, it's because in my perspective, 
personal opinion, uh, the narrator of the government is very uh, solid in Vietnam. That's why I think in the future, Indonesia need a new narrator to deliver, to lead this country. Thanks a lot, Pagita. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. Uh, look, I, uh, yeah, we, we need a better storyteller. And, and we've actually got a fantastic story. And I, I don't see any reason as to why we, we cannot tell the story in, in a beautiful manner. Uh, and and I, I, I hope that we're, we're going to be able to tell the story better. So I, I don't disagree with you. And, and, and I don't disagree I mean, with you I in mean. the sense that, you know, they, they have a much, uh, you know, one guy makes a decision in Vietnam. Whereas here, mm -hmm. if any potential investor comes here, they have to go to the center, they have to go to the region, they have to go to the city, they have to go to so many different offices and they get, you know, one guy will tell you A, another guy will tell you B and, you know, at the end you get confused. Whereas in Vietnam, you just go to one office and you get all the answers you want. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Pagita. Okay, thank you, Mas Anto, Pagita and Pa Ananda for the very interesting discussion. Uh, we have one question from one of our students, but uh, it's quite long. Um, I'll read it out to you. When compared okay. to other countries in Southeast Asia, the global value chain of Indonesian SMEs uh, lag far behind. Malaysia is said to have 46.2% uh, of SMEs, uh, Thailand 29.6%, the Philippines 20.1%, Vietnam 21.4%, while Indonesia only in Indonesia, only 6.3% of the total SMEs in Indonesia is involved in the trade chain in Southeast Asia. The contribution of uh, SMEs to national exports in Indonesia is also still very low compared to other countries, in which in, in Indonesia, it's only 15.8%, $23 billion. Uh, and while in Vietnam, it's 29.5%, uh, and the low contribution of Indonesian SMEs was due to several factors, including stagnant economic growth, a trade balance and de deficit payments, uh, the current account that continues to widen, income inequality and limited employment. Uh, the question is, uh, when economic growth was 7% uh, in the SBY era, the SMEs in Indonesia contributed uh, to a national GDP of 15.8%, which is equal to 20, uh, three, 323 trillion of uh, total non-oil and gas. What is the percentage in uh, the Jokowi era? Is it higher or is it lower? That's his question, but. Well, you know, I would, I would you know, I, I don't have the exact figure, but I would make the following comments. Uh, paradoxically, uh, the number of people that are actually employed by the small micro medium entrepreneurships make up about 95% of the total workforce of Indonesia. As I said last week uh, in, in the other separate lecture, we've got about, you know, 130 million people working in Indonesia of which 125 million people are actually relevant to the micro, small, and medium entrepreneurships. So 95% of the workforce is actually OMKM, or micro, small, medium entrepreneurs, and their employees. If, if we take a look at the export figure, okay, the export figure predominantly relies or hinges on the extractive industries. Call it coal, bauxite, nickel, palm oil, gas, right? Which are basically produced by the large companies. These are not produced by small, medium entrepreneurs. These are produced by large companies, right? So on, on, on the employment side of the game, the small and micro and medium entrepreneurs make up a good chunk. Whereas on the economic activity side, and you know, using you know, export as a metric of economic activity, it doesn't make up you know, a significant amount of the export component of the economic equation, right? And 
I think part of that has to do with a number of things. Number one, it has to do with the fact that most, if not many, of the small, medium entrepreneurs or micro, small, and medium entrepreneurs and their employees do not have access to capital. Okay, I've been making this point over and over about the lack of financial inclusion. Our financial inclusion is only to the extent of 40% or slightly less. That's basically the percentage with which people over 15 years old have a bank account in the country, right? So most of these entrepreneurs and employees of the small, medium, and micro entrepreneurs do not have a bank account, do not have access to capital. That's, I think, one reason why they do not have the ability to integrate themselves with the outside world, right? I.e., they cannot export a whole lot of goods and services, unlike their bigger brothers and sisters who could export a whole bunch of palm oil, coal, nickel, gas, whatever, right? So that's, that's, that's one observation. The second observation is that the reason why the micro, small, and medium entrepreneurs don't engage significantly within the economic equation, particularly in the international context, is relevant to their not being as marginally productive as their counterparts in Singapore in Malaysia, in Thailand, even in Vietnam, right? So you've got a financial inclusion issue, you've got a productivity issue, and you can call that an educational issue, right? Because productivity is correlated with the degree to which you're actually educated. So I would argue that, you know, if we want to basically ramp up the proactivity or the engagement of the small, micro, medium entrepreneurs in the economic equation, be it domestically, but also internationally, we've got to address those two issues. We've got to make sure that they have access to capital in a much bigger way. And we've got to make sure that they actually are more productive than ever. Now, to the extent we can address these two issues, uh, I think it's only a matter of time. Uh, before we can actually see a much bigger engagement of the small, medium entrepreneurs. And, and I think what, what hurts or, or what is painful right now is that it is the small, micro, and medium entrepreneurs that are being hit by COVID-19 because of their inability to physically be close to their customers, be physically close to their suppliers, be physically close to any of their stakeholders right, because of the fiscal distancing, you know, policies, uh, that they're being hurt in a big way. So I, I think there's, as I've said earlier, there's a risk of the small, micro, medium entrepreneurs going through a permanent impairment to the extent that they're not remedied by anybody. And here, you know, I mean the government because the government seems to be the only logical institution that could actually lend a hand. And this is in reference to, you know, the number of times I've basically said that, you know, we need to get the liquidity support for the OMKMs or the micro, small, medium entrepreneurs as quickly as possible before they actually get into a permanent impairment type of situation. That I think would be structurally more risky. Yeah, and, and it would make it even more difficult for us to repair or rehabilitate or even improve, you know, their, their ability to access capital and their ability to actually be more productive. So that's, that's another long-winded answer to the long question on, on the role of uh, small, micro, medium entrepreneurs in the economic equation. Yeah, I think the, the question is correct in that, you know, we don't have a large representation within the trade element of the equation from an UMKM standpoint or micro, small, medium entrepreneur standpoint, but we could fix that over time. Thank you, Pa. And there's another question from Marcela, which I think is related to uh, the previous question. So uh, she's asking that if the government has um, a roadmap for the development of the UMKMs as the foundation of the national economy, um, shouldn't they be protected more 
uh, I'm just paraphrasing here, but shouldn't they be protected more in the uh, current pandemic? And what do you think is uh, the government's uh, strategy um, that should be taken in order to uh, strengthen the WMKMs at this uh, pandemic era? Well, you know, uh, I, I can tell you, I think what could be one of the more concerning topics of discussions amongst the government officials right now, right? If they were to actually provide liquidity support, for the UMKMs, it would be with respect to their not knowing how to actually reach out to 100% of the micro, small, medium entrepreneurs, right? How do, we, how do they actually allocate money for these people and how do they actually make sure that everybody of the 125 million people get the liquidity support that he or she needs, right? And the problem or the underlying problem with that is that not everybody of that 125 million people has a bank account, right? So imagine if, if they did have a bank account, if every one of the 125 million people did have a bank account, then it's all registered properly by, be it the tax office, be it by the Ministry of Social Welfare, be it by the Ministry of Finance, or be it by whatever ministry that's supposed to be in charge of this, they could be accountable for whatever penny, whatever money that they actually allocate and disperse for every one of these 125 million people whose demand has collapsed in a big way, right? So the way to fix this is, I think, to make sure that everyone of the people that are working in this country, particularly those within the UM Kaim space or micro, small, medium entrepreneurs, would have a bank account that is transparent, that is known to the government, so that you know, there is a pipe through which you can actually disperse money in times of difficulties like what we're confronting or what we're going through right now. So that, that I think would be one step forward as to help the, the, the small micro, uh, you know, medium entrepreneurs to get better. I don't know if that's an answer to the question, so. Okay, thank you, Pagita. Yeah, okay. So, Pagita, there's another question from... See, the... see let, let, let me make an additional comment. To the extent okay. that it doesn't, it doesn't reach out to everybody okay. of the 125 million people within the UMKM space or micro, small, medium entrepreneurs, then the, the topic or the concern of moral hazard kicks in, right? because then you'll run into a situation where the money is actually not going to where it's supposed to be going. So I can, I can, I can buy the argument of moral hazard if it doesn't go to the right place or right person. But there is no reason for us not to see that money going to the right place if we had made sure that everybody of these 125 million people had a bank account. And that, that I think could have been some of the earlier steps that should have been done. Yeah. Like in the United States, you know, the, the IRS or the tax office has details on the accounts of everybody that, that files taxes. And, and I think it is so punitive if anybody doesn't file taxes in the U.S. that, you know, he or she would file obediently. Uh, even if they're residing outside the United States, they would still file very obediently. And when they file, there's always an account. And, and that, that was what made it easy for the United States government to actually provide liquidity support, you know, for the millions of people that have lost jobs. You know, I know many people in the United States have received a check in their mailbox from the U.S. government because they knew, uh, you know, where everybody stays and where everybody's bank account was. Yeah, because I think also because the current condition of this pandemic is the type of business that relies on imports. And um, now everyone like locked down their territories in order to break the chain of distribution of COVID-19. So the only one expected is the domestic industrial strength. Correct. There has been a supply disruption because most of our supplies come from overseas. And as a result of which, it presents a threat, but an opportunity at the same time. A threat because 
we can't get our supplies like we used to yesterday. Uh, we have to get it from domestic sources, but we're probably not getting it as quickly, as well, as nicely, because you know the domestic sources may not be as productive as the external sources, and, and the domestic sources may not be available. So we've, we've got to learn how to adjust and adapt. And I think this adaptation uh, is a process that we're going to have to go through. I think the tail of this adaptation is going to be good for, for you know, you know, our own supply chain capabilities and uh, for our own economic equation going forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Pagita. Thanks, Mbak Marcela, for the question. Um, there's a question. Okay, so there's a question from Budi Setiawan, Pagita, uh, from one of our at attendees. And I'm just going to read out his uh, chat here. Hi, Pagita. I am Budi from Palembang. I want to know about your perspective related to life after COVID-19, particularly about uh, consumer be behavior. Thank you. Well, I think it's going to change on both sides of the equation, on the supply side and also on the demand side. Okay, let me give you an illustration on the demand side. I don't think people will be jamming the aircrafts like they used to be, right? Uh, I don't think they want to be sitting next to each other in a jam-packed manner on an airplane, right? I don't think people would want to, you know, ride uh, anything that, gets them very close physically with you know other people so that's on a demand side so there's going to be a drop of demand on transportation like it or not uh you know i think it's going to affect adversely uh the the airline business uh, more particularly i think the low-cost airlines because the low-cost airline uh, relies on a business model that's driven by volume uh, because the price is so low you know, it's a volume gain, but to the extent that they're not going to be able to get as much volume as they had before, uh, their, their business model just flips. And, and I think you could see permanent dislocation of some airline or low cost airline players, uh, you know, post COVID-19. That's on a demand side. Uh, whereas on a, on a supply side, uh, I, I can see also shifting, you know, within the supply side of the game, uh, people are, are, you know, the restaurant business, I think, is, is, is another. Uh, I don't think there's going to be as many restaurants uh, as we might have seen because probably a good 20 to 30 percent of the restaurant owners uh, have been permanently impaired uh, to the point that they're not going to be able to go to the bank and get credit again, much less, you know, recruit baristas, waiters, and what have you so that they could, you know, operate like they used to. Uh, so the, the, the supply is going to change and people, I think, are more accustomed to eating at home because, you know, they, they want to be healthier. And, and I say this, I think, safely for the next two to three years, uh, beyond which God knows if we were to, you know, come up with a proper vaccine in the next 12 to 18 months, I think people might revert back to some sort of a normalized behavior like we might have seen before. But I don't see that happening in the next year or two. Uh, I, I think we're only likely to see any potential renormalization like we might have gone through before, uh, maybe two to three years from today. But that only would take place after we basically, you know, uh, get get clarity on vaccination capabilities. Until then, I think, uh, boy, there's going to be uh, shifts in in some of the demand components and also some of the supply components. So. In, in essence, basically, uh, the global GDP will shrink, uh, you know, because, you know, there's going to be a collapse of aggregate demand to some extent because of shifting behavior. And, and I don't see this as a, as, a, as a compensating, you know, type of behavior, meaning if, if we reduce uh, one particular behavior, we're going to make up another behavior that would actually increase aggregate demand. No. I would actually see a, a, a dilution uh, of, of uh, aggregate demand. And as a result of which, I think aggregate supply is going to come down. Thank you, Pat. So basically, there's 
going to be change, restructurization in uh, social life, but there are, there are also going to be opportunities then but for socialpreneurs and yeah. the likes. Okay. So we have a there questioner. Is from our attendees, from Fadil Zikri. He will ask the question directly to you. Go ahead, Fadil. Okay, hello. Hello, Pagita. Hello. So, Hi. Yeah, so uh, I have peace of mind that would be, so globalization has made the world become much more integrated. Like for example, the textile industries, we got the cartons from Australia, then being loomed in China, before it being sent to Indonesia to only produce the garment product. So what should be done so that we could improve our role in the global supply chain? And how SME in Indonesia could benefit from the, uh, this situation? Uh, thank you, Pakita. Look, I, I've, I've kind of uh, outlined a little bit of the answer to your question uh, in terms of how the SMEs in Indonesia could strengthen you know, their posture uh, so that they could, number one, compete with uh, you know their peers domestically or internationally and and number two how could how they could actually better integrate with the rest of the world uh i i, I say all this uh, with you know the background of uh, basically trade becoming much more bilateralized as a result of which uh, competition uh, amongst or between countries is going to intensify uh, will there be an opportunity for indonesia to actually participate in in, in the textile, uh, you know, global supply chain, like you had suggested, you know, maybe we could be the, you know, the, the, the final segment of the supply chain within the textile industry or the garment industry that could actually have a much better value additive proposition than, than those other guys in the supply chain that were only uh, just producing the cotton. Uh, uh, it, it, it will take a higher marginal productivity and, and it will take, you know, having access to capital. And, and I, still, I still see systemic limitations, unfortunately, with respect to our small, medium entrepreneurs. And, and, and I think it's going to take a while before we actually fix the financial exclusiveness of these small, medium entrepreneurs. Uh, and also until we fix uh, the problems with respect to their marginal productivity. Uh, having said that, I think there's a lot of opportunities uh, considering that, you know, our economy hinges on consumption for about 60% uh, or, you know, 60% of our economy is actually, you know, uh, our own consumption. And, and, you know, most of the goods and services that we consume uh, are actually imported. Uh, or let me take that back. A good chunk of what we consume in terms of goods and services uh, are, are still imported. And, and there's no reason for us to, to not import. You know, I, I, I think if we fix the SME, we could see a much more proactive role of the SMEs in basically supporting the, pros, the consumptive propensity of, of the Indonesian people. And we're not there yet. So, I mean, you know, the, the, the easier example would be handphones. You know, uh, you know we, we consume or we buy about 80 to 100 million handphones a year. And 100% of that, 100% of those are actually made in China. Yes, uh, there are some assembled handphones in some parts of Indonesia, but they, they make up not, not very much of, of uh, you know, what. being actually mostly still made you know outside Indonesia that I think is an area where I think the small medium entrepreneurs could be more proactive thank you Bagita. okay uh, for the next questioner we have uh, someone uh, from our panelists uh, Simon Bell would you like to ask the question directly or should I ask it for you I'll ask it for you then Okay, so in the chat, um, he asked, following on from the current question post COVID-19, uh, what will vanish? What will stay the same? And what will emerge globally in uh, general and in Indonesia more specifically? Your insights. I think, about that. I think we'll, what, what, what will vanish would be some airlines. What would vanish would be a bunch of restaurants, a bunch of hotels. 
uh, not because they're not going to be needed again. They cannot, it's, it's mainly because they cannot resurrect uh, themselves. Uh, and, and as a result of liquidity support being given uh, at a later stage as opposed to earlier stage, uh, many of these, uh, I think, have basically become paralyzed. So, you know, we, we saw that in Australia just a few days ago, Virgin Australia has filed for bankruptcy. Uh, that, that, I think, is, is probably more of a reorganization activity as opposed to a complete bankruptcy proceeding. Uh, but but I, I do foresee uh, airlines, uh, restaurants and hotels and, you know, other types of transportation modes uh, vanishing. Uh, and and I, I, I actually see a, a compression of demand for transportation. I think people are learning to actually be more uh, efficient by being immobile. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've, we've recognized and we've realized that, you know, we, we do not have to be as mobile or as active as we used to be uh, in order to be productive. Uh, we can be almost as productive uh, by being at home, you know, through Zoom. Uh, I, I, I think the vanishing of some of uh, the elements of the economic equation could be compensated by the increases in usage of you know virtual capabilities such as you know uh, you know virtual telecommunication like what we're doing right now through zoom thank you pagita uh, i hope that answers your question simon um there is one other question but from the q a section in which uh muhammad rafi asks uh, i'll read it out Hello, Pagita. I am building a marketplace startup currently focusing on UMKM in services or UMKM di bidang jasa, offline basis. My question is, when do you think the, economic, the economy will be back to normal? Since our plan is to launch it by September or November, as we are worried if the demand is still low by that time. Hopefully you could give your insights uh, about this. Thank you. See, the, the, the recovery depends on two things, right? How quickly we can actually resolve the health issue. And I've been saying this a few times in the past that we still are not at a point of ascertaining the degree to which we have been impacted by the health issue and the degree to which we can actually get around the corner on a health issue, simply because we have not tested enough, right? We are at a ratio of about 400 to 500 per 1 million you know, on, on, on testing vis-a-vis -vis other countries, you know, neighboring countries like Malaysia and Singapore, which are testing at 10,000 on a per 1 million basis. So how do you make sure, how do you know that you're actually not going to go through a massive, uh, you know, transmission if you have not tested, you know, significantly? Much less, how would you know when you're going to get over the, the curve? Uh, if, if you don't even know, you know, the degree of transmission properly. Uh, so without knowing this, we're not going to be able to know when we're actually going to be able to bottom out economically or financially, uh, because the, the economy is basically, you know, superimposed by the, the health issue. And that I think is, is, is a set of issues that we've got to, basically get clarity on before we can actually utter anything to anybody that we're going to be okay and out of the hole by October, November, or December. Uh, I think we can intuitively, intuitively, uh, you know, predict uh, that, you know, we should be out of the hole, you know, in the next few months, but that's intuition. It's not empirical. Uh, and, and, and so what, what would be needed for the small medium entrepreneurs who want to participate in a marketplace? Look, the marketplace, the digital marketplace, as has been seen by the likes of the Toped, the Bukalapak, and the Shopees of the world, uh, they have done well uh, thanks to subsidization by the shareholders who have deep pockets, right? So at the end of the day, if you want to basically provide um, you know, a marketplace for the small, medium entrepreneurs, 
which I hope uh, would be, you know, distinctive from, you know, the other marketplaces that would have basically been around. Uh, you've got to make sure that the products and services that are being offered at the marketplace are actually competitive, right? Number one, so that they appeal to the commoners or the people that would be consumptive of these goods and services. Uh, then you've got to also make sure that, you know, on the supply side, these uh, small, medium entrepreneurs have access to capital. While at the same time, you've got to make sure that the consumers also have access to capital. So those, I think, are the key ingredients uh, that I would go through before I, you know, I, I start to think about coming up with, you know, a digital marketplace for the small, medium entrepreneurs. But then you've, you've got to basically map that against uh, whether or not or the extent to which, you know, the, the other large, you know, marketplaces uh, could, could also serve the needs of the, the, the small, medium entrepreneurs to the extent that they do. Then I think you've got, uh, you know, a pretty difficult journey uh, to go through. But to the extent they don't, uh, then I think you're going to have an easier journey going forward. Thank you, Pa. So we have uh, another question from um, Mbak Marcela. Mbak Marcela, you want to ask directly? Pagita? No? Okay, I'll ask it for you then. Um, she's asking about printing money, Pa. Uh, yeah. The quantitative, e quantitative easing that you've mentioned many times. Uh, how can, what can we do to mitigate the inflation? that everyone is worried about and what uh, what, DPR, what DPR just decided about the amount of it, would it be enough? Yeah, look, I, this, this has been out in the, in the media and, and I think I, I might have been misconstrued. Uh, you know, it's as if I want the government to print 4,000 trillions today. No, that was not what I meant to say. What, what, what I meant to say in some of the lectures that I've given, and you know, unfortunately, I think the media kind of spun you know, what I was saying or what I was trying to say. Uh, what, 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 what essentially I'm saying is that if we were to think about addressing both the demand side and the, the supply side of the game, we may have to think about providing liquidity support up to 4,000 trillions on the basis that 1600 trillions would be for the demand side and 2400 trillions would be potentially for the supply side these would be the debtors that are actually you know uh, relevant to the banking system they owe the banks money and they are going through a restructure uh, and they need to restructure and they need to get working capital so that they could actually continue to supply goods and services but we do this in stages okay and when we do this in stages, we can assess and reassess as to whether or not the steps we have taken would have been effective, right? In basically band-aiding uh, the, the wound and also making sure that there is a recovery uh, from the wound. But to the extent that it doesn't start recovering yet, uh, then we may have to put on additional band-aids. So, as we do these in stages, I still foresee a scenario where the fiscal space of the government is still not enough uh, for the amount of liquidity support that needs to be given within the first stage. Now, given the limitations of the fiscal space, uh, there is no other way than just basically borrowing from each other, i.e. the Ministry of Finance borrowing from the central bank or the banking system borrowing from the central bank. And the Bank uh, of Indonesia would, you know, inevitably have to print because it's, it cannot, you know, basically uh, get from its uh, pre-existing foreign exchange reserves or its pre-existing balance sheet. Uh, so as a result of this printing money, uh, now we need to calculate uh, how this money is going to be used. If it is used for the day-to-day -day purchases of foods, uh, it should not be inflationary, Okay because we're dealing with basically replenishing the lost capacity amongst millions of people that could no longer afford to buy foods on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, if you're replenishing the lost capacity of buying foods, uh, it should not be inflationary. 
it will be inflationary if the foods are not available, if the foods are scarcely available. But uh, then if you take a look at the supply side, be it rice, there is enough supply of rice. Uh, let's not forget there's gonna be harvesting in the month of May for rice. And sugar, there's gonna be enough sugar by way of converting the refined sugar to the consumption sugar. There is enough of everything, chicken, beef, and all the basic staples that we need to live by. There have been price hikes with respect to three items. And that would be sugar, which is starting to come down already because the supply is being ushered. And the second would be with respect to onions. But that would have been by way of the limitations on the distribution, not the limitation on the production. The distribution has been limited because of the physical distancing policies at the city and the regional levels. And the third would have been the price of chili going up. It's because, again, of the limited distribution capabilities, not the limited production capabilities. So if, if we do it in such a fashion that, you know, we're no longer going to have limitations on the distribution capabilities for chili and uh, onions, then we should have stable prices for the food staples that are going to be needed by the people who have lost their you know, consumptive propensity or buying capacity, which will be replenished uh, by way of the printing of money that's going to be given to you know, these people from the government. So I don't foresee a hyperinflationary environment uh, that you know, some people might have suggested in the last few days. This is totally, totally different from what we have experienced in 1998. In 1998, before BLBE, was issued for liquidity support purposes, the inflation was already at a 50 to 60% level. But if we take a look at the inflation for the first quarter of 2020, it still hovers at around 2.96%. Now, the question is, will it go up from 2.96% if we print this money and we give it away uh, for you know, these uh, little people so that they can replenish their you know, consumptive propensity? It might, but I don't think it will go to you know, the, the kinds of hyperinflationary environment that we might have seen uh, in, in 1998. I, I think that sort of an argument is somewhat misplaced. The second argument that I would caution or present to you would be that you know, a number of people have said that you know, there's a risk of moral hazard uh, if, if we do stuff like that. I, I say, yes, there is, but there is a way to mitigate that risk. Uh, let's not forget, in 1998, there was a lot of moral hazard to begin with before the crisis took place. Because of the moral hazard, the crisis took place. Whereas today, the, the, the capital structure of the banking system has been restructured much more healthily as compared to 1998. The intentions of the small, medium entrepreneurs uh, who need to be helped are of the best intentions possible as compared to some of the poor intentions of the entrepreneurs that we might have seen in 1998. So I, th I think we're, we're looking at two completely different situations between 1998 and 2020. Number one, you know, back then it was already hyperinflationary. Right now it's not inflationary at all. Number two, there was moral hazard back then. Right now there is no moral hazard. We're talking about people who are in pain that actually would have had the best of intentions. Now, there could be a moral hazard issue if this money were to go into the wrong hands because we do not know their account numbers, which is why I go back to the point that, you know, it's important for the micro, small, medium entrepreneurs to have access to bank accounts and to have access to capital to the extent they do have access to bank accounts and capital. I think the less of a risk of a moral hazard in the event that, you know, we provide liquidity support for these people. Thank you, Pat. So um, we actually don't have any more questions, Pat, but I'd like to ask uh, one question uh, about okay. China's, China's um, role in the global e economy. So how do you think, how do you foresee that, um, how do you foresee the change of role uh, of China in the global economy post COVID-19? Well, China represents about 14 to 15% of the global economy right now. If we go back to, 
you know, the year 2000, just 20 years ago, China only made up about three to 4% of the global economy, right? Now, if we were to extrapolate from the current 15% of the global GDP uh, to what China could be 10 to 20 years from today, it's gonna be a far bigger percentage than 14 to 15% today, right? Uh, just by way of mathematical extrapolation. Uh, but, but then the, the question would be, you know, will it surpass that of the U.S.? I, I think there's two sides of the, the equation here. You know, there's a school of thought that believes that the United States is going to prevail at about 23, 24 percent and has to make sure that China is never going to catch up with the U.S. I'm not so sure. I think China, mathematically speaking, has a good chance of catching up with the U.S., right, in terms of, you know, percentage of representation vis-a-vis -vis global GDP. Uh, but but will, will, will China be able to basically repeat, uh, you know, the dominance or domination that it enjoyed uh, until about 200 years ago? Let's not forget, okay? If we go back the last 2,000 years, for 1,800 years from year zero until year 1,800, China and India made up about more than 50% of the global GDP. So whatever China is about to experience in the next few years is actually not unprecedented, okay? It is actually similar to what they had actually gone through for 1,800 years. So on that basis, I take comfort in the fact that China has a natural instinct and a natural ability to basically be, again, a dominant part of the economic equation. So the next question would be, how would you know, the U.S. react to this? Or how would the U.S. Uh, act upon this possibility? I think the U.S., you know, stands uh, on, on a somewhat strong footing in the sense that it's got, you know, advantages over China in, in the following three categories. Number one, it's got an advantage over China in demographics, okay? By way of immigration, uh, their, their demographic, you know, profile is going to continue youthful you know, for a long time, at least 20 to 30 years, whereas China, by way of the one-child policy, is going to look demographically increasingly less youthful in the next 20 to 30 years. And, you know, less youthfulness means less productivity. More youthfulness means more productivity. Uh, the second uh, would be with respect to the United States uh, having an advantage with respect to energy sourcing. It's got access to coal, it's got access to gas, it's got access to oil, which are still going to be needed in the next 20 to 30 years for energizing the day-to-day -day livelihood of people and humanity. Uh, and, and the third advantage that the U.S. may have over China is, is basically innovation, uh, you know, by way of, you know, their technological innovations in Silicon Valley. I think that's going to continue in a robust manner. But does that mean China will not be able to catch up with the Silicon Valley, you know, innovativeness? Uh, I think China will be able or could be able to, to, to catch up with the innovativeness that prevails in the Silicon Valley. So you've got on one hand with China, you've got scale, uh, you've got, you know, discipline, you've got productivity, uh, which is lessening, you know, in the next few years, the productivity part but the scale is gonna be you know, overpowering the United States. Uh, but China has got you know, needs for energy, needs for food. You know, for all the noodles they need to eat, they're gonna to have to import a whole bunch of wheat from Russia, from Europe, and from the United States. So I, I think China, in order for itself to be a dominant power, instinctively, it's got the wherewithal, but I think it's gotta be able to do things in ways that would be acceptable, you know, by, by the, the global community uh, better and more than, than before. Now, to the extent they do that, I, I think, the, you know, they, they, they run a good chance of becoming a, a, a much more dominant uh, economic power than ever. Thank you, Paso. So despite the COVID-19 pandemic, they're still going to strive uh, as an economic power then. Yeah, I mean, you know, even if you think that there's going to be relocation of, you know, many manufacturing capabilities from China to, to you know, other parts of the world, uh, that, that also is going to take time. And at the end of the day, the CEOs, the companies that are making decisions to relocate factories, 
they're going to have to make their decisions not just based on geopolitics, but they're going to make their decisions based on PNL. So if if the PNL doesn't work out because the the new countries they want to relocate the manufacturing capabilities to uh, don't have the necessary you know marginal productivity that's desired, uh, then they may just change their mind and stick to China as the the the, the you know the pre-existing and prevailing location of of manufacturing capabilities. Okay. Thank you very much, Pat, for your time and for your insights. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that everyone has benefited from it. Thank you, and I've benefited from the questions too, which are great.